Mm, is it recording? Yes, it is. Great. So good morning, everyone. Uh, today, what we'll be looking at is digestion. And in terms of how we'll be approaching it, is that we'll be looking at we'll be looking at some questions right regarding just because the in terms of on the e classroom itself uh, there are some things put out there for both the lecture in terms of what you're supposed to um, go through in terms of the lecture and the lab and for so as an extension within the lecture with the lecture component in the classroom, there's a recording of this lecture already there in terms of digestion. So you could go through it at your leisure, but I just want to check your knowledge. It's a way, a different way of, of reviewing the material instead of going over the lecture again. I just let's look at some questions to see indeed if we have you know, fully understood what is going on, or if there's some areas that we could improve on. All right. So everybody seeing the questions? Yes. Okay. Yes, and at the, at the end of the lecture, what I will do, this is available online. I will post the, um, I'll post the link in the, in the WhatsApp chat. So, you, could, you know, at your leisure as well, you could go, go through it you know, just to make sure that you understand exactly as well. All right. So, I'll post this link when it, once, we, once we're finished. So, have no fear. And you could go through it, you know, as a, as a revision tool also. It's a nice way of doing it. All right. Okay. Okay. So, let's go. Question number one, and another way as well, I would encourage you to answer. I'm recording, you know, those who answer and so on. And somehow I would work in this into your, into your, um, one of your grades in terms of your, of your, of your responses and so on. So please, you know, I, I do encourage you to respond. Hey, nothing wrong. Don't feel that you have to respond to get it right. You know, it's just the whole issue is really just responding. Because as you respond, um, I would take note of it. So you don't necessarily have to have, get it right the first time. Okay, let's go. Question number one, which of the following is not a function of the digestive system? Hmm. All right. Anybody wants to throw in something on that? Which of the following is not a function of the digestive system? E. e. All right, who is that one who answered there? Tahira. Tahira. Well, actually, well done, Tahira. You're quite right. All right, so let's have let's have a look at that. The others. Um, is ingesting food, is that a function of the digestive system? No. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, it is, right? That's what ingesting means, taking in the food, and we take in the food within the oral cavity. What about digest food to small molecules? Is that a function of the digestive system? Breaking it yeah. down. Yeah, that's what it does. Breaking it down ideally to small molecules, which can then be absorbed. Very good. Absorb nutrient molecules. Well, I just mentioned that. Eliminate non-digestible waste. Well, everything that is not um, taken in, that is expelled, as we will see, or is sent out through the um, rectum and anus, is expelled to the external environment. All right, so the answer is indeed E. So as I mentioned, I would send this link uh, for you all once the class is through, all right? So you'll have access to this at your leisure and you could practice as well, not only on this, but on other topics related to uh, the class as well. All right, all you have to do is come here and you click on it, it has other chapters, right? Okay, question number two. Digestion of food refers to what? When we talk about digestion, what do we refer to? Breaking down and breaking down of the food. Right. So in the context of these answers here, which one do you think it is? A, B, C, D, or E? C. Huh? Allowing small molecules. C? I don't. C. You say C. Allowing small molecules. Why not large molecules to cross because cell membrane? If we're breaking it down, means we're making it smaller. I like the logic. What new? Who is this I'm talking to? Let me do it. Marsha. Marsha. 
Mm -hmm. J.K. L. M. Lawrence Mohammed. Marsha. The long name. Oh, the long. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Right, Marsha Clement. Right. Good. Right. Very good, Marsha. So very importantly, it's the small molecules, right? Allowing small molecules because as Marsha rightly said, the large ones wouldn't be able to cross, right? And we're breaking them down to get the small ones to get across. Right, all the others allowing the liver to produce bile. Digest that doesn't refer to um, digestion, but the only one. These are the two that really refer to them, and C is the correct one. Very good. So number three, strictly speaking, something refers to the breakdown of food by enzymatic action. Which one is it? So, uh, digestion, sir. Yes, by definition. Who is that one? Celine, sir. Celine Ali. Celine, thank you, Celine Ali. Yes, first name on the roll. Okay, great, yeah. So that's the definition of digestion, refers to the breakdown of food by enzymatic action. In the mouth, which enzyme begins to break down food in the mouth? It's something found in your saliva. So the enzyme- The amylase, I think it's what? Very good, salivary amylase, very good. Who's that one, nice Selene again? Yes, sir. Right, you got a lower point for that one. Very good. Yeah, so salivary amylase, um, it, it starts to act on carbohydrates in the mouth, and that's where digestion begins. Very good. Let's go to number four. Which of the following statements is not correct? So in other words, four are correct. Which one is not correct? Hmm. Anybody, like I say, hey, don't, don't be afraid to give an answer if it's incorrect. Well, we all learn. And if I laugh at you, I'll send $100 via um, Republic Bank instant thing where you just go by Republic, punch in a number and you'll get the money to get lunch. Because I'm not supposed to laugh at you, but whatever, you give a response. All right? So don't be afraid to give a response. Um, sir, sir, D. D. Right. No, no, C, sir. Sorry, C. C, C as in cow. Digestion yeah. of food in, in humans, a process that occurs inside of cells. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It, which is not correct because where does it take place? It takes place in the digestive tract, right? Such as in the stomach, well, from the mouth all the way to the anus. And that's not inside, that's actually outside of the cells themselves. The digestion or the breakdown takes place outside of the cells. So what you have is like in the stomach, for instance, you have specific uh, cells, the parietal cells, the chief cells, sorry, secrete, secreting um, acid, which leads to the breakdown of food. So the digestion or the breakdown doesn't take place in the cell itself, but actually takes place outside, outside of the cell, the breakdown of the food. And then the food is actually absorbed across this membrane into the cell once it is broken down. But the digestion itself takes place outside of the cell. So therefore, this one is incorrect, C. Very good. Who is that I was talking to there? Alana. Alana. What are you saying? Alana? Samson. Uh, Samson. Yeah. Yeah, I have it by um, surnames. Yeah, very good, Alana. Let's go to the next one. Taste is due solely to stimulation of receptors in the noon. In the nose. Amy, what do you think? Sinkia, Amy. Is Amy Sinkia? Yes? Sinkia, yes. Yes. Um, this is due solely to stimulation of receptors in the nose. I think that's true. When you're tasting something, is it only in the nose that um, in terms of how you, you actually taste something? Or is there something yeah. else? Taste buds. Taste buds, right. And where you find your taste buds? In the, in the tongue. tongue. So therefore, is this statement true or false? False. False. Very good. Yeah. Well done. And who is this I'm talking to? Amy. 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 Remind me of last. Oh, Amy Sinkia. <laughs> and I was the one who called you. Know. Very good, Amy. Right? So that is not true. So when we're thinking about the whole taste, taste involves both two things. It involves both the taste receptors and also the smell receptors. As Amy rightly said, you know, in your tongue, you have your taste receptors, but you also need to smell, which is why when you have the cold, some people might recognize that, food begins to taste differently, right? It begins to taste differently, or it, don't it tastes really strange. 
which is probably why, you know, if you do have the cool one of these things, often pe people often like is chicken soup or some kind of soup. And that soup is usually a bit so on the salty side, right? So very importantly, their taste is not only stimulation of the nose, but it's the nose and the tongue, two things responsible for the whole simulation process, right? When, when you're tasting something, strange as it might sound. Very good, Amy. Okay, let's go again. Which of the following sequences does not trace the path of food to the digestive tract in the correct order? Yes, sir. <laughs> Funny a. Thing. All right, so we have A. So this one is incorrect. Which of the following does not from the mouth? Oh, does these... not. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. It's all good. You could correct yourself. Which one, is, uh, yeah, which yeah. one does not? <laughs> which one um, it is? Just the, uh, does not. Yes, and then go on the reverse, go on. See. See, see. see. Let's see. Which of the following does a stomach? Enlarge intestine, small intestine. Small intestine. Why is it correct way? From the stomach, where does it go to? Small intestine. It goes from to the small, small intestine, and okay. then it goes to the large, oh, right? Yeah. Small, then large. OK, so two people answer there. Let me hear who's the two people who answer there. So I give the wrong answer, Marshall. But well, you correct yourself afterwards. So that's yeah, not, so you're still getting, you, you're still getting a wrong. point for I that. Wrong. I read it wrong, sir. But that's you why. catch yourself. You, you yeah. catch yourself. So that was good. Yeah. And who was the other person who piped in as well? Gotcha. That's uh, me, sir. Tahira. Tahira? Yeah. Anybody sir. else? I hear like a third voice was anybody Sasha. else? Sasha. Sasha. Um, last name, please, if you don't mind. Matthew. Please. Matthew. Very good, Sasha Matthew. Yes. Very good. All right. So do take note in terms of the order. Does not, this one doesn't. Mouth esophagus, stomach, that is true. Esophagus, stomach, duodenum. Duodenum is what part? Is it part of the large intestine or the small intestine? The duodenum. The small intestine. Right. Who's that to answer there? Celine, sir. Celine Ngozi. No, Ali. Celine, Ali. Celine, Ali. Oh, Celine with a C, don't you? Well done, Celine. Yeah. Right? So very good. Um, stomach, duodenum, large intestine. Duodenum is part, as Celine mentioned, part of the small intestine. So this is correct. Ascending colon. When you look at the large intestine, ascending, you go up. Then you come across transverse and the descending. So this order is correct. So the only one that is out is C, number six, See, it goes from the stomach, not to the large intestine, but to the small intestine, then the large, right? Always remember it goes in that order. Very good. Let's go to the next one. Something a chisel shaped teeth used for biting. Okay. Ooh, wait, everybody know that one. Mm, we, have some, we have some biters in this class. <laughs> yo, yo, biter, biter, biter. Um, in Hindi, what does biter mean? Anybody want to help me out? You know, you have that song, Ooh La La La, Mama Sita, and they say, Baita Baita for Mama Sita. I thought it was Baila, who liked to dance. Um, Baila <laughs> to dance, all right. Baita, Baita means, I think Baita actually has, a, is, a, is a Hindi word, Baita. It means, um, let me think, Baita Baita for Mama Sita, to cook in Parata for Santa, Ooh La 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 La, Mama Sita. Can I know this my song? Huh? I catch it's your not a small song. You don't know it. I catch your cooking parata for Santa. So how is that Hindi song? That is a Hindi. No, no, no. But you know it. The words in the song, some of the words um are actually Hindi, yeah. But you okay. know it, right? Oh la 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 yeah. mama sita. I catch your cooking parata for Santa. <laughs> yes, you pull out your pira. Your pira, if I'm not mistaken, is a short stool that I use. Yeah, where is it on? Correct. So you know that one. Yeah, you call out your pira. Yeah, but baita, baita. It, my mother tell me what it means, you know, but I just can't remember. Yeah. Anyhow, I'll come back to that. Anyhow, but chisel tape, teeth, as everybody said, is in sizes. So I think I'll have to give everybody a mark for that because everybody know that one. All right. So everybody know that one. That was very good. All right. Yeah, incisors, those are the ones in front, and those are used for tearing and also for biting. Right, as we well, uh, as, 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 as they said there, right, incisors used for biting. Let's look at the next one. The nerves and blood vessels are found within the something, which part of a. Oh. 
Caesar. Which one? C. In terms of C, yeah. is the pulp quite right? Who is yeah. that one who answered there? And I can ask them. Last name, please. Augustine. Augustine. Anika? Is it Anika or Anika? Anika. Anika. Okay, thank you, Anika. Right? And yeah, very true. The pulp. Number seven was you, sir. Yes, go ahead. Number seven was canines. No, the ones used for biting is the inside. Um, um, is the incisors. Let's have a quick look. If we would. Chisel shaped are always canines. Mm. Yeah, let's have a look at the teeth. I know I spelled chisel wrong. Chisel shaped teeth in the mouth, right? Which teeth are shaped like a chisel? Um, the incisors. And which ones are the incisors? Yeah, I know which ones are right. Right, let's have a look. Right, so the incisors. Right, these are the ones here. And some people, they really have them a little. So these are the incisors over here. And some people really have them. It's shown here. Some of them, some people have them a little long. When you think about Dracula, and even though that is there something, of course, from myth. Okay, don't have any pictures shown there. I don't know where it is. Chisel teeth, I know. Uh, yeah. Those are the, the long ones here. Right, so the incisors, uh, those are the, the sharp one. And they're usually used for tearing, but you're right, the canine are right behind the incisors. All right, so these will be the incisors here. This, there's a canine here, this one. Incisor and a canine, let's see if we could get a nice image. In terms, here we go. So, mm, now this is, right, so the canines, Right in front here, these are the incisors all to the front here. One, two, three, four. These are the incisors and these will be your canines. The ones right, yeah, one, two, three, four, the canines. So one, two, three, four, those front ones, these will be incisors and this will be a canines. So the canines are the one which some people, they're quite, they're a bit long and you actually have to go to the dentist to get it shaved down, right? So it wouldn't scare people when you smile, all right? Or, or come across as being half, I don't know, Dracula, you know, something like that. So in some instances, yeah, they go to the dentist to get them shaved down. Okay, very good. But glad you asked in terms of that, the canines, because the canines are the ones, so the four incisors, you know, your two front teeth there and the one on either side, and then right after that is a canine. So I'm glad you asked that question. And maybe on it, we could look at the others one time. Let's have a look. Um, if you were to look at them, so very simply, as we said, one, two, the first four, those are the incisors. So the first four, those are the incisors. And if this would come up. Right, then you have the premolars, right, here we go. So the incisors, one, two, three, four. The one right after the incisors is the canine. Those are the ones that could be a little long and have need to get shaved down. Then you have the premolars, one, two, one, two on either side. And then the molars, one, two, three, right? So you have three and two, five. Five and five, 10 are the premolar. Well, the premolars are two and the molars are three, right? And then you have the canines, one on either side and the incisors, the four in the front. Right, so you have four, oh, there's baby teeth, right, in terms of milk teeth, but the secondary, you do have um, a full complement in terms of it. Of course, we know with your baby teeth, they drop out and then they grow into your permanent teeth. Wouldn't it be cool then if you lost a tooth, just like how you grow a baby tooth? I mean, sorry, you're not your baby tooth, you grow your other tooth, that it would just grow out the rest of your teeth. You know, so if you imagine you just lose a tooth, not an issue, 
what happens is it just grows out. Some there are some persons who actually uh, do research on that topic in terms of uh, trying to get it. All right, some people having issues with the internet, yeah. So understandable. So I just responded to one of your colleagues there who um, just sent a message, okay? But I'm glad you asked in terms of the teeth. So do note, incisors, canines, one on either side, then you have two premolars on either side, and then you have the three molars. Molars, of course, very important for chewing, all right? Anybody here like to chew chicken bone and leave a pile of dust? a triangle, like a little pyramid on the plate. Yeah. No, no. But yes. one of the things, yeah, one of the things for those of us who do cook, right, you, you recognize the marrow is actually quite flavorful, right? Which is why sometimes, you know, if you have a little, if you're cooking up peas or something, some people, you'll put in some bones or something in it to actually give it flavor. But if the marrow is quite flavorful, which is why some people like to chew up the bones, the chicken bones, you know, you do get a lot of flavor. And in fact, when you look at some other animals, in France is actually a big delicacy in terms of with the, um, uh, from uh, the cow, they actually, the, the marrow itself, now it's, there's a big delicacy. So they, they cut the long bones of the cow into manageable bits and they cook it, you know, with a little bit of salt and, and seasoning and so on. And they bring it to you on the table with a, a little fork. So you could just pull it out of the bone and actually eat it. It's a big, big thing over there. Okay, let's go forward. Number nine, which of the following comparisons is not correct? Hmm. So D. All right, so number nine, somebody says D, mumps is a viral infection of the tonsils. When your tonsils get infected, what is it called? What itis is it called? Tonsillitis. 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 What you're saying? Okay, who answered the question first of all? Who said D? Let me get out. Nyla. Pardon? <laughs> Nanlal. Last name, please. Nanlal. Nanlal, yeah. The way I have it, Swinalia, 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 Swinalia. Swinalia. Swinalia, my bad. Right, Swinalia. Mm -hmm. Very good. And who else piped in? Well, I said tonsillitis, Samson. Who's it? Last name, Samson, Alana, good. Who else? All right, so just you, right? So very importantly, so the viral infection of the tonsils is um, uh, tonsillitis, right? And it's not mumps, right? So that's the difference there. Let's look at number 10. Um, but this is right, caries is tooth decay. So if you go to the dentist and you hear dental caries, you're talking about tooth decay. Uh, gingivitis, inflammation of the gums, that is true. Um, periodontitis, periodontitis, inflammation of the periodontal membrane, that is true, and heartburn, of course, stomach acid in the esophagus. And when we're looking on the topic of this heartburn, the stomach acid in the esophagus, what sphincter, malfunctioning of what sphincter will cause, now a sphincter is a ring of muscle. So which ring of muscle malfunctions and allows the stomach acid to come up the esophagus? So which is the, in other words, and what is the name of the um, sphincter at the top of the stomach. What is that one called? So in other words, at the base of the esophagus. So they call it, since it's at the base of the esophagus, what do you think they will call it? Um, the transverse. Mm -mm. Nope. You're talking about the transverse rectus muscle, right? You're talking about the muscle. That is the muscle itself. But we so we specifically looking at another muscle, right? The one is at, at the top of the stomach. Sorry, yeah, yes, the sphincter muscle at the top of the stomach. So it's at the base of the esophagus. So what do you think they call it? The what sphincter? The esophageal sphincter. Thank you very much, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what they call it, the esophageal sphincter, right? Uh, who answered that one? Augustine, Anika. Anika. Augustine, right? And who answered and didn't, didn't who, who mentioned the muscle, which was the big muscle? Um, Samson. Pardon, Samson. Samson, Alana? Yeah, so you mentioned the muscle, that is the muscle, uh, the, the big muscle that runs um, behind the stomach. All right, so this one, 
Good Sorry, morning. Don't get you on the internet. Okay, that happens. That's okay. All right. So, so that was quite right. The esophageal sphincter that is the one that prevents um, things from coming up into your mouth. And what's another name for um, heartburn? There's another name for it. Is that what disease? What you saying? Who is that one? Augustine, what a Anika and Anika, sorry. Anika, yeah. Yes, good. Right, very good. So, so acid reflux disease, it has the other name for heartburn. Yeah, All right, very, go ahead. So, you said that um, when the muscle, the um, it's, it's a GL sphincter, uh huh, yeah, that that muscle weakens and causes the fluid to come up into the esophagus, correct? So it doesn't work properly. So what happens usually then, at, let's say at night, is in a constricted position. So it doesn't allow the contents of the stomach to come out. And usually in your stomach, the stomach environment is acidic, which means it has a pH less, it's approximately 6.4, pH less than seven, it is acidic. So that muscle is constricted usually. Um, when you, if, if something goes wrong, let's say it's not doing its job, so it's not constricted, I mean, it is in a relaxed position, so things could pass through. Now, when you're standing up or walking around, it's not a problem, but which is why you only get acid reflux disease when you go to bed, because when you lie down, what happens? Now the contents of the stomach could actually run out because of the fact that sphincter isn't working, normally shut off. It, it keeps the contents of the stomach in the stomach. And it only opens when, let's say, you're eating food um, or, or you're drinking, things are going down into it, it will open. But once they're there, it closes off. So the thing is, when I, if you do have an issue and you lie down, um, if you do, if the sphincter muscle is not working properly and it relaxes, the contents of the stomach, literally, it flows up the esophagus and it comes in, you feel a burning sensation in the esophagus and it also, sometimes it comes up to the level of the mouth itself, right? So that is known as acid reflux disease. How you could correct it, I do know they say one lie on the left side because when you lie on the right side, that encourages the flow of the contents of the stomach out and the left is a lot less. And you could also prop up um, your upper um, body. So like put pillows behind your back, that is one way of doing it. Of course, there's medication, antacids and so on, which you could take that actually um, neutralize the contents of the stomach so you get a burning sensation as well. But the things practically what you could do, prop yourself up, lie on the left side. That helps tremendously, okay? I don't know if I answer your question. Yes? Oh, yes, sir. Okay, great. Let's go on. Which of the following comparisons is not correct? C. 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 What is your voice box known as? The larynx. Your larynx. What is your pharynx? The pharynx is the area that is inferior to the, well, you have the nasal pharynx, to the nasal ear uh, cavity. Uh, yeah. Right? So not to get them mixed up. Let's have a quick look in terms of the, of the pharynx. You have the nasal pharynx. So the pharynx is this area here, right? You have the nasal pharynx, you have the oropharynx and the laryngeal pharynx, or laryngopharynx, or it's shown here, right? So you have the nasal pharynx, the oropharynx, well, the hydro, also known as, hy another, also known as a laryngeal. Let me see if I see it, another one. Pharynx. The nasopharynx, oropharynx, and this area, not shown on this one. Right, this one is showing it, right? So the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx, right? The laryngopharynx is usually up until C4 in terms of the border, right? So these three areas here, this collectively is your pharynx, but your larynx, not shown, is the area that is inferior or below the level of C4. So this is your larynx here, 
and very, and that one is associated. I think this one shows it, right? The larynx, um, that's your voice associated with the, um, your vocal cords. All right, so, so this one here, your voice box is not the pharynx, but your larynx, who traditionally have, have a deeper voice. Oh, sorry, who answered that question, by the way? Clement Atherton. Clement, last name, sorry. Marcia Clement Atherton, the long name. Oh, <laughs> sorry, yes. Marcia Clement Atherton. Oh, where is it? Clement, Clement. Oh, yes, got it. Got it, thank you, Marcia. Right? So generally speaking, in terms of species, which ones generally have a deeper voice, males or female? If you were to look at humans. Males. 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 And why would males have a deeper voice? Because the voice box is bigger. Yeah. But what, what purpose does it serve? Why do they have a why would they have a, a deeper voice? Anybody here have birds, mind birds? No, uh, nobody have parakeet or anything like that. When you look at birds, um, or anybody ever see a, um, in in terms of uh, colorations, right? Male and female, which ones tend to be, when you look at animals, which one tend to be more flashier? The males or the females? Male birds. The male, think about a peacock, right? If you look at a peacock um, versus a peahen, let's have a quick look. And it, it will explain the reason why. All right, if we were to have a quick look, yeah. All right, peacock, peacock versus peahen, All right? The male versus the female. Have a look. <laughs> it is a non-comparison, really, All right? If you look at it, there's the male and there's the female. Females don't have all this drama going on, right? There's the male. And we look at this more when we get into reproduction, but all that to say is the same thing when you're looking at um, with voice or vocal inclination, sorry, intonation or the ability to make sounds. The males in general, they tend to have um, a, low, a bigger vocal range. When you look at birds, if I'm not mistaken, I wanted somebody to correct me. It's the males that have, they have the wider range of sounds. When you look at um, primates, for instance, ch chimpanzees, um, pseudo mongo mongobees, and different monkeys or primates, primate is the right term. The ones that make most of the noises um, are the males, not the females. So bottom line, it is thought that this is, this is done primarily for reproduction. It's a way that females actually gauge the suitability of the mates. So in terms of um, with peacocks and so on, not only they do make noises, but the plumage actually, you know, the ones that look better, they are actually seen as being more suitable. And similarly in the primate world, those that have the bigger vocal range are seen as more suitable. So maybe there is some truth to that. Right. Sometimes, you know, if, if you, you know, you hear a certain voice when somebody, let's say, call you in the morning, right? And you say, hello. And they answer, hello, this is Rahu, you know, as opposed to somebody calling and they say, hello. Hey, hey, me. And you're like, oh, gosh, you're calling again. You know, if somebody has a shrill voice. So maybe there is some truth to it in terms of the depth of the voice. You know, there is something to that. So which is why males in general, they have a deeper voice. Again, attributable to hormones, testosterone, which are, so it begins to appear during their, re, when they are um, reproduct, reproductively mature, right? During, um, very importantly there, to note, you only get a change in the voice when they become reproductively mature. So we'll speak more to that when we look at reproduction, but all that being said, that's why males tend to have deeper voices. Uh, in terms of bottom line, it shows off the suitability of a mate. And maybe I could do some correlation between it. The deeper the voice, maybe it has something to do with um, producing very um, offspring that will sustain the species. Maybe there is a correlation. We'll talk more about that when we look at reproduction in the next couple of weeks, okay? All right, let's go forward. Which of the following comparisons is not correct? Like, let's look at number 11. So C. 
See, gastric juice secretion from intestinal gland. Where do you get gastric juice secretion from? From where? Gastric juice the is stomach. secreted in the stomach. 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 All right. So, who answered the question first of all? When I who uh -huh. said C? Miss Swin Swinila. Very good. Right. And who answered gastric? Um. Sorry. Secret from the stomach. Who answered Last stomach? Question. Last name, please. Matthew. Matthew. Yeah, the way Sasha, right? The way I have it set up his last name. Yeah, I know that I have a way to switch it wrong. Let me see if I can switch it wrong. I don't know how to do it. Let me dig up and do something wrong. All right. So gastric juice secreted from the um which glands secrete them in the stomach? Hmm. Well, it's the chief cells uh in the stomach that actually secrete gastric juice. Right. So that's very important there. Let's look at the next one. Number 12. Sir, I saw someone yeah. named Preferred put true as the answer in yeah. the chat. Sphincter, yeah. for this one, sphincters are muscles yeah. that encircle tube and act as valves. Yeah, it prevents, yeah. That is true. And who is it who put it? Maybe they're having some trouble with the internet. Preferred. Yeah. What Griffith. name? Griffith? Griffith. Yeah. yeah. Lutric? Yeah. Very good. And that is true. And we mentioned that sphincters are muscles that encircle tube. They act as valves. Let's see if we can have a quick look at the esophageal sphincter. Let's see what it looks like. So as we mentioned um, here, so the esophageal sphincter, right? This is the one that actually causes or shuts off the stomach. This is the upper esophageal and then the lower esophageal sphincter. This is the this is the one in particular associated with the stomach, right? The lower esophageal. So the upper, you do have an upper one as well. So this is the one most critically that shuts off the stomach and sphincters and muscles, they encircle the tube and they act as valves, right? So they do act as valves in terms of letting things in and out. All right, so that's Excuse good. You. Yes, go ahead. Please, yeah, I'm wait in the waiting room. Right, already admitted her, thank you. All right, so sphincters that encircle tubes and act as valves. Let's go on to the next one. Um, Hmm. Which of the following hormones causes the stomach to churn and increase secretory acidity of the gastric glands? Huh. B, well, it, sir. Yeah, it's something really where your gastric glands is gastrin. Right? Gastrin. Always, ga, yeah, gastrin is the one that increases the activity of the gastric glands. Okay, who answered that one? Who answered there? Yes. Sunny. Chandel, Chandel. On. Thank you, Chandel. Very good. All right. So you remember gastrin increased the activity of the gastric glands. Which of the following is produced by cells of the duodenal wall? Now the duodenum, right? This is part of the small intestine. So which of the following is produced? The E. E. The C. Secretin and CCK. Cholecystokinin oh. and secretin, yeah. So this is one that you just have to know. It's a memory call one. Okay, who answered that one? Miss Nanlal. Miss Nanlal, very good, Miss Nanlal. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Swinalia, great. Very good. Let's go again. 15 now. If HCL penetrates the mucus and the stomach wall, auto digestion of the wall begins and you'll get an ulcer. Is that true, true or false? True, sir. True. 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 All right, that is true. Right, in terms of an ulcer. Huh, let me ask this question. Usually, uh -huh, usually there's a bacteria associated with ulcers. What is the name of that bacteria? Um, 
-hmm. as associated that is usually found. So in terms of thinning of the mucus, they find that there's this bacteria that helps in the thinning of the mucus mm -hmm. and it's usually found in most ulcers. What's the name of that bacteria? It's H dot something. H by Laurie. What are you saying? Who's that one? Augustine. Augustine, yes. H pylori. Very good, Anika. Yeah, so H pylori, they find that in the majority of, of um ulcers, the H pylori bacteria, Helio, Helio pylori bacteria is usually found in the stomach wall, in the, within the stomach itself. Right, so that is very good in terms of knowing that. I'd be on the scope of the class, mind. I just threw that out there. It's good that you did know it in terms of H pylori and um, ulcers. Let's go forward. Which of the following substances will cause the re release of secretin from the duodenal wall? So what causes the release of secretin? Sure, this one is actually, even, the answer is D, but this is beyond the scope of the class. So you don't have to know this one. All right, so let's move on. So we have to know 17. What allows chyme to enter the small intestine? That's a good one. B. 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 A sphincter B. between the stomach and the small intestine. Let's have a look. Yeah. Right? So between the stomach here, it is over here. Right? So it's, and they call the lower sphincter. So the upper one is the lower esophageal because you do have the uh, upper esophageal sphincter up here. Right? Right, so you have the, the upper and the lower esophageal sphincter, but the sphincter, uh, the base of the stomach is known as the pyloric uh, sphincter. So you have the upper lower esophageal and the pyloric sphincter, right? And if, interestingly enough, the bacteria that causes um, ulcers is H. pylori, because it's usually found in this region here. It's found in the stomach in general, H. pylori. So all of those things are related in terms of the uh, naming. Very important to take note of that, yeah? All right. So this sphincter, in terms of entering, of allowing it to enter. So this is the one, the sphincter here after you have it mixing into the chyme and the secretion of HCL, then this one relaxes and allows it to move into the duodenum or the first part of the uh, small intestine. Good, let's go forward. Which organ will secrete sodium bicarbonate to neutralize the acidity of chyme in the small intestine? Which one does that? A, the pancreas. Yes, yes, yes. All right, who answered that one first? Who was the first one there to answer? Matthews. Matthews, in terms of last name. Sasha, very good. Who else? Okay, it had somebody who was joint with Sasha. Who else answered? Nana. Nana, Swinelia. Swinaila, sorry. Uh-huh. Good. All right, so very importantly there, it's the pancreas. And what, let me ask this follow-up question. What hormone, right? So if you were to look at hormones, if we were to look at hormones, what hormone does the pancreas secrete? Very important for regulation of, of sugar Insulin. in the blood. Insulin. 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 What is, okay, somebody answered first. Who was it to answer first? Okay, I guess it's more than one. So who answered? Let me hear you. Ravnadi. Last name? Fuentes. Fuentes. Right, Annalisa, thank you. Somebody else answered as well, who was it? Devika, Devika. Devika, very good. Last name? Ragunath. Ragunath, very good. Ragunath, very good, yeah. Anybody else answered? Okay, that was it. All right, so very importantly, the pancreas. So it is both, um, it has both endocrine activity, endocrine in terms of secretion of hormones, it secretes insulin, and it has exocrine activity, secretes bicarbonate to neutralize the acidity of the chyme. In the pancreas, very interestingly, and oftentimes, you know, that's another question that comes up, the 
pancreas has both endocrine and exocrine activity. It's one of the two structures that does, that does both. All right, so always remember, anytime you hear endocrine and exocrine, endocrine, endocrine meaning it secretes um, a hormone and exocrine means it secretes something that aids in digestion, in this case, neutralizing sodium, neutralizing uh, sodium bicarbonate. It secretes that, which neutralizes the acid from the stomach. And so therefore the pancreas has both endocrine secreting hormone exocrine secreting substance substances it has that function all right all right now let's go forward 19 no 20 all right 20 the end products of lipid protein and carbohydrate digestion enter the blood capillaries of the villi is that true or false true. True. all right so who answered first there last name fuentes fuentes good Very good, Ms. Fuentes, right? So it sure does. And let me ask this. Now, in terms of lipid absorption, there's a special pathway for lipids, right? Lipids get absorbed in what, not only do they flow through in terms of being, do, not only do they utilize the blood system, right, after absorption in the stomach, but they utilize another system in the body to transport. Uh, to, to be transported around the body. Where is it? Lipids, they're absorbed and transported via which system in the body? The lymphatic. What you're saying? Who is that one? Annalisa. Annalisa, last name? Fuentes. Fuentes. <laughs> Sorry, you'll, you'll hear me saying it all the time. I just have it listed in terms of last name on, on Marosa. Very good, mm -hmm. right? And let me ask this question. Why do you think... Now, this is a this is could be a guess to me. Why do you think fats they prefer, or oftentimes they will go through the lymphatic as opposed to going through, let's say, a capillary? There's one word. It, it relates to something. It's a property of fats or lipids, which is why they'll prefer to go through the lymphatic as opposed to go into, let's say, a capillary. What do you think it is? Now, think about what you know about the properties of a capillary in particular, and then think about why it is something that is like a, like a, a lipid, which is, wouldn't want to go through it. It begins with S, ends in E, and has a Z. Uh, thank you, thank you, who's that one? Jamie. Last name? Oliver. Oliver. Yeah. And that is the reason why. You see, the thing is, um, by the very nature, lipids are big, right? Let's have a look at it. Lipids are large. When you, when you think about um, the size. Right? When you look at a lipid, right? Ooh, look at these things. They're long. They're big, right? They're big. Look at cholesterol. It has a ring structure, it's a huge free fatty acid, look at it's long. Look at a triglyceride, ooh la la, look at a phospholipid, mamma mia, right? So it's big. So the thing is, when you think about a capillary, remember capillaries are really small. How small, as I often like to say, right? The width of a capillary is about 0.1 of a micro, of a micrometer, of a micro micrometer. Let me see if I'm not, let's have a quick, Review of that uh, capillary width. So the width of a capillary is about eight to ten microns. All right, just enough for for a red blood cell. And remember, in terms of a red blood cell, sorry, in terms of a micron or a micrometer, how big is a micrometer? Take your thumb and your forefinger, press it together. And when you now start to see a space between your thumb and your forefinger, that is one millimeter. Divide that into a thousand, you get one micrometer. So imagine just 10 of the, if you could just imagine when you get one micrometer, 10 micrometers, that is the width of a capillary. So the thing is capillaries, just appreciate, is really small. So when you have this Mr. Mr. Cholesterol coming along, when it reaches a capillary bed, it's a problem. 
So what instead they do, they go through the lymphatic system, which is wider. And that is why, you know, fats prefer or are transported through the uh, lymphatic system via the lacteals um, in, as opposed to going through the capillary system. So now you do have them, they do pass through, but they prefer to go through the lacteals or the lymphatic system, just because of the fact the lymphatic is wider and it's easier for them to pass through. Okay, good. Let's go forward. Um, let's look at 22. Which of the following organs contain villi? Small intestine. Small intestine. Small intestine, what you saying? Yes. Yeah, what do the villi, okay, first of all, who answered that one first, and then we'd come second? Huh? Alan, Amy. Calicia, Alan? Yeah. Huh? Right, and who's the other person? Amy. Augustine. Augustine, Anika, Anika. Yeah, no, I noticed. Who else? Marshall. Last name. Because I said C. Clement Atterton. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, my Marshall. Right. And who else? Amy. Um, I said C. Last name. So it have, um... That's now I'm coming to your question. Just Amy. Amy, what's your last name? St. Kyle. Yes, right. Good. Right. Now somebody was asking a question. Go ahead. No, so somebody in the chat. Um said C to Lutric. Lutric? Yeah. Right, hang on. Let me open up the chat. So I, I, let me open up the chat on my, on my phone so I can see it. Oh, that's okay. I, I realize it's not. Yeah, you all have a group because it's not the general one. So it's all good. Mm hmm So Lutric. chat on hmm? Zoom at she means a chat on Zoom. Oh, on Zoom. <laughs> yeah, good one. She good just one. put up something. She said she on work, so she's using the chat. It's all good. I am mad at her. All right. I'm trying to figure out how to get to the chat on this one. Let me see more. Pause recording, stop, blah, blah, blah. Hide name of annotators, blah, blah, blah. I don't see any. Um, participants, let me see if it's in here. That would make sense. It should be here. Somewhere wrong here, the chat. But I'm not seeing it. Okay, so let's say Lutric. Was it, what's her last name, Lutric? Oh, it is a Griffith. Right, got it. Right. So the answer, which one, which one we are doing, which number? 22. 22, right. The small intestine, right? They do. And what do the villi do? What's the function of the villi? Absorption. Absorption, all right. Name? Augustine, Anika Augustine. Right. And what else? So, because when you. Surface area. Surface area, area. area, yeah. Yeah, very good. You got a surface area. That's what it does. It increases the surface area. Let's have a look um, in terms of villi. Mm -hmm. So one of the things when you look at, at a villi, so think about if you have to look very simply, let's look at this, right? If you have something here, Right, let's just say it's a straight road. You have this surface area coming here. But because of the fact you have it going up and down, up and down, up and down, you actually increase the distance. If you were to take, let's say, a piece of string, if you would just lay it flat, it will go from here to here. If you take that same piece of string and you go up and down, it probably stop around here. So in going up and down, you actually increase the surface area. And that's one of the important things. So will I do two things? One, yes, they're important for absorption, but most critically as well, they increase the surface area. So those are, that's another important thing associated with it. All right, so those are two things. When you hear about villi, that should come to mind. One, yes, absorption, but also two, increasing the surface area. Very good. All right, let's go again. Which
Which of the following organs function in terms of water, salts, and store non-digestible material? The D. What you saying? All right, who answered that one first? Here last name? Liesel. What's your last name? Alan. Calicia. Anybody else? Sir Amy. Sacha. Sacha. Last name. Yes. Anybody else? Clement Atherton. Clement Atherton. E. Oh, got it. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Um, Ragu. Ragu? Dori? Ragunath. Ragunath. Devika? Yes, sir. Uh huh. Good. All right. So that is what it does. One of the, of the large intestine, it absorbs water. Very importantly, um, water, salts, and store non digestible material. Right, prior to it being um, sent out in terms of feces. So on the topic of um, absorbing water, so therefore if the large intestine is not, in particular there are bacteria that work symbiotically within the large intestine, they get protection and they also help in the digestion and absorption of water. So if your large intestine is not working properly, how would your stools look? Would it be watery or would it be solid? I would say watery. Would it, would it, yeah. All right, so who answered watery first? Augustine. Augustine, very good. And Anika, right? Yeah. So it would be watery because of the fact, remember, the large intestine absorbs water. If it's not doing its job, therefore the water will be passed out, which is why when you oftentimes have diarrhea, your stools are watery. Everybody, anybody here had diarrhea before? Yes. Sir. Yeah, right. And what happens when you sit down on the on the throne? Right? Pressure. Everything pressure, comes up. Pressure. <laughs> All over the tank, right? <laughs> right, yeah. You spray <laughs> over the place, right? <laughs> right? And you know you have it really bad, you know, because as soon as you finish. You have to go back. I don't know if you ever had it like that. You know, you now come off. And you, let's say you walk three steps, then you have to go back because it's a constant running. So the thing is, when you're losing water, physiologically in the body, when you lose water, what follows water in terms of loss? When you lose water, something follows it. It's an it's a element, two elements in particular that join together and you find it in the kitchen. Um, salt. 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 Okay, who says salt first? Who is that one? Samson, Alana, very good. Yeah. Said in, is an electron electrolyte? It is because sodium is an electrolyte. The definite. What is an electrolyte? You know, it's a nice big word. Break it down for me. What is an electrolyte? What does it do? An electrolyte. Very simple. Yes. Go ahead. What does an electrolyte do? It's a big word, but what does it what does it mean? An electrolyte electrical carrier, electrical charge, or like that's a it. Voice, right? Okay, so who answered there? Sound like a male voice. Khalil Khan, sir. Khalil Khan, very good, Mr. Khan. Yeah, that's all it does. It carries an electrical charge, right? So when you're looking at um, electrolytes, that's all they do. They carry electrical charge. So you'd have to throw back your mind to SNF one when you're looking at um, neurons and the carrying of the nerve impulse. Remember the gates, what are the gates that open when you have, when, it, when the neuron reaches threshold, what you have happening, sodium gates open and what rushes inside, sodium rushes in and you have depolarization. Sodium carries a positive charge, Na plus. So when it rushes in, it depolarizes or it changes the polarity. What does that mean? Well, it just simply means usually on the inside of a neuron, the charge associated is usually negatively charged. So when those gates open and sodium rushes in, this positive charge, it will change the inside charge from negative to positive. And that's what depolarization, depol the word D means change or not. So it's polarity, not polar, changing the polarity. 
from negative to positive when sodium rushes in. So that process when sodium, when gates open, sodium gates open, sodium rushes in, it's called depolarization. And then of course this wave of depolarization passes along on the inside of the membrane. And that is how you have an electrical charge in essence moving from one neuron to the next all the way down um, from point A, let's say from the dendrites where it gets its stimulus, the, the gates open on the axon hillock, which is just inferior to the cell body, they open sodium rushes in and moves down the axon, down to the terminal dendrites, right, at the end of the um, neuron. So very importantly there. So sodium in the body as a physiological process, sodium always follows water. Whenever you have loss of water, you have loss of sodium. So therefore, if somebody is dehydrated, what do you need to give them? Based on what I just said, what do you need to give them? So, yeah, G cell, very good, right? And we come back to G cell. Let me put it in another context for you. When somebody presents, let's say, in casualty, or they bring them in, and they hook up a drips, what does the drips have in it? Like yeah, yeah, I don't know. Well, you, you'd learn later on there some other drips, like ringers and so on, that have other things. But usually they will hit them with a, a saline drip, right? So, so a saline drip. And the saline drip is what, is what percentage uh, sodium? Lost fluids, yes, in terms of a saline. Um, sodium chloride really 0 0.9 yeah i was saying 0 0.7 so 0 0.9 percent and it's actually written on the bag itself right 0 0.9 percent sodium chloride you'll see it right and that is the usual one because not only do they need rehydration in terms of getting the water back in right you all might be familiar with this in terms of the saline drip right but they also need to get that salt in because of the fact that when you lose water, as they're doing when they, let's say they're diarrhea, if they have diarrhea, right, they're losing the water. Not only do they lose water, but they're losing salt as well. So you have to get back in water. Hence the reason, of course, you give them sterile water, but most critically, you have to get back in salt. So you usually hit them up with a 0.7, 0 0.9%, sorry, saline drip, right, to get back in that salt. And why do they need that salt? Which organ system is most dependent on salt for its function? Nervous. Yeah, we just mentioned it. Very good. Who is that one? Who answered it? Jamie. Last name, please. Oliver. Oliver. Very good. Yeah. Right. So, which is why when you're when you're um when you're weak or when you have diarrhea, as some of you all might have experienced. You feel very weak. Physically, you feel weak. And the reason why is literally the nerve impulses cannot go from point A to point B. So you want to raise up your hand, but you cannot because you don't have any sodium. So therefore, your nervous system doesn't, it doesn't work. So incredibly, though, however, if it is, you know, when somebody has diarrhea, excessive diarrhea, they lost a lot of fluid, they lose a lot of salt, so they're just there lying down. <laughs> Once you introduce that saline within about five to 10 minutes, boom, they pop, it's incredible. They will pop back up, be able to sit up and so on because of the fact you are reintroducing that sodium, which is critical for the functioning of the nervous system. And remember, in terms of the nervous system, it works in collaboration with the muscular system, skeletal system, and your skeleton to bring about movement, which is why when you do have diarrhea, you don't feel the move. Somebody mentioned g -sol. G cell is an oral, well, a rehydrant. Cell, anybody ever tasted it? Yes, sir. How is this? Kind of salty. -ish. Yeah, salty ish. Yeah, quite so, you know. Give it a try, right? It is salty ish, right, in terms of the taste. So, G cell is often used um, as a, for somebody, particularly children, you know, when they have diarrhea, you give them G cell, it makes it G cell. If you don't have G cell, what could you do? Could you drink salt water? Make ah, very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or uh, rehydrant water, salt, and sugar. Yeah, right. So, very simply, it's a nice. You can make out. You can make it yourself. Ooh. All right. 
put it on oh, blah, 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 blah. Okay, there's a little too much. You're going to a little too much detail, right? Six level teaspoon of sugar, half a level teaspoon of salt in our, in our liter of clean water, right? So let's remember six teaspoon of sugar, half, it's not much salt you need, half of a teaspoon of salt and you mix it in a liter. And believe you me, in a sense, you know, that is what Gatorade is. That is what Pedialyte is. Except, of course, they put it in a fancy bottle. They put a big label, they put a color, they put other flavoring, and they have my other athletes, you know, only um, advertising it and so on. But it's nothing more than this, actually. All of them contain the same thing, salt, sugar, and water. You can make it yourself. You really could. So do, do remember, if it is, let's say, you don't have somebody is dehydrated and you don't have access to, let's say, um, g -Sol or Pedia light. So what you could do, you can mix it yourself. And where else could we get electrolytes from? Another natural source um, of electrolytes. Usually it is sold from the back of a pickup truck with a coconut man with a cutlass. Coconut water. Yes. <laughs> All right, who said it first? Who said it first? Alan. Alan, Calicia. All right. And Anika. Augustine, Anika, Augustine. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Right. So do remember, do remember that you do have coconut water as well. That is also, it, it contains a lot of minerals because of the fact it's nutrients for the developing plant. That's why, you know, the endosperm in terms of the coconut tree. That is, in, a, in, in essence, is a seed. Right. So do remember, I think that um, it is also. It is also a source for um, for electrolytes. Very important there. Good. Let's go forward. We're almost there. Yeah, go ahead. Before we move forward, I just want to ask a question. Yes. So, since the large intestine is responsible for absorbing water, so that mm -hmm. it will come out, you know, solid. Yes, firm. What yes. causes the large intestine to not function in that way, so that you know? Well, very good question. Um, infection. So you do have, there's something called the microbiome, which refers to the bacteria li which lives symbiotically in your gut. So in other words, if we didn't have those, there are certain bacteria, which is actually passed on from parent to child. If it, if it is, if they are not functioning properly, you'd have problems. So in fact, and they, they, there's lots of research into this. And when you do have I mean, you do have a chance to get there's something called the microbiome, right? You have these bacteria living in your gut. And as with everything else, they need to have a certain environment to work properly. If that environment is thrown off either by the one, um, let's say your immune system is not working properly, so you allow invaders to come in, let's say, so it becomes invaded with other microorganisms which could be harmful to these gut bacteria they don't do their jobs and therefore if they don't do their jobs well now it is you would not get the proper absorption of the water itself within the gut so very importantly this microbiome there's a lot of research into this in terms of maintaining a microbiome maintaining the environment so that they replicate adequately just keeping them happy there are lots of theories about the microbiome. And in fact, there's a theory which says that basically all diseases could be traced to the microbiome, those gut bacteria, you know? Yeah. So in other words, when they don't function well, or if they're not happy, if the environment in which you live is not suitable, that is what causes sickness. So yeah. there's also what is, there's also another theory that our immune system is actually taught. The microbiome tells it. Okay, you know, these bacteria go, these are, it teaches, the microbiome is responsible for teaching your immune system how to function properly. So there's a very nice relationship then between our body, our immune system and the microbiome. When that goes out of sync, well, that's when you have issues happening, such as they don't function properly. So what you have happening is watery stools. And how does that happen? As you're well aware, let's say if you leave something on the counter, or you eat something that's a little off. A rule of thumb, if ever you have to smell food twice, is a very good idea to throw it away. 
right? <laughs> because of the fact, when you smell it once, and you know, like, well, are you sure? And you have to smell it again, throw it. Because more, more likely than not, something is wrong, right? And usually, in terms of, that means the food, let's say, has bacteria, microorganisms, and what they do, they produce toxins or waste products. Those waste products, we perceive them as a certain smell, which we know as, quote, unquote, bad, a bad smell. That's how we know if something is, so when you smell food and it's not smelling right, what is happening is other microorganisms uh, begin to digest on the food and they're giving off toxins. These toxins could be harmful to the microbiome or the bacteria in our gut. So let's say you still override that, you know, you're like, I could eat this man, you warm it up and you still eat it. And as soon as you eat it, of course, what happens? Oh, your stomach starts to feel odd. And the reason why is because of the fact there are toxins, literally is toxins or poisons which are produced and is in the food and you actually ingested it. And now they are affecting the gut bacteria. They are not produced, they are not fun because of the fact that they are affected by these toxins. So what happens? They don't do their job. When they don't do their job, your stools come out watery. So you, when your stools come out watery, you lose salt. When you lose salt, you start to feel weak and you lie down. And which is why it's critical when that happens, you have to fix it. And to fix it, of course, you, you have to, first of all, one, get rehydrated and two, get salt in you. Usually what happens, your immune system will actually fix it. So which is why, yes, when you have diarrhea, you'll feel bad for a while, but you will get better once you, Re, once you do get rehydrated, and once, of course, um, you get salts in you, you know, sodium chloride. If you don't get rehydrated, simple as it might sound, if you don't get rehydrated, if you don't get those salts in you, what could happen? Dot, 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 dot. Dot, 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 dot. So, simple, something simple as diarrhea. What could it cause? Dot, 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 dot. Dehydration. Dot, dot, dot. And when you're dehydrated, what could that lead to? Dot, 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 dot. Death. Death. It might sound death. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So when you look at it now, I don't like to use the term, but third world. It's a big problem, diarrhea, right? Imagine that the world WHO reports that it is about, or imagine almost being around you know, a million children um, under five every year. Uh, every year, something as simple as diarrhea. Because of the fact, as we mentioned, diarrhea, loss of water, loss of salt. So you just there, so the child now becomes just there, they're weakened, they're just there, they can't move, and they keep going off, keep going off, and they die. Right? So, you know, very importantly, diarrhea, something as simple as diarrhea it is lethal in certain parts of the world. And every year, approximately a million children die from it. Right? So, always remember that once you see symptoms of, associated with diarrhea, it's always important, you know, to look to, um, to fix that issue. Okay? We good? Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. I, I don't know if I answered your question. Yes, sir. Okay, great. All right, good. Yeah. All right, let's go forward to the next question. All right, good. Almost there. 20 minutes again. <laughs> let's go. All right. Um, which of, I like 29, mm, which of the following statements is false? Me, sir. Which one is it? C. C. Yeah. Prolonged diarrhea can lead to constipation. Yeah, that is false. What prolonged diarrhea actually, it does the opposite, right? It can lead yeah. to death. Right, but not constipation. Constipation is when you stop up. And has anybody ever been constipated or know of somebody who's been constipated? In other words, then you can't pass. You can't pass stools. Who who does that answer the question there, by the way? Ashley Mangru. Mangru, thank you, Ashley. Very good. Right? So 
prolonged diarrhea that doesn't lead to constipation, but it leads to constant passage of stool, watery stools, as we mentioned there before. All right, good. Let's look at, um, pardon? True. It, eh? In diarrhea, too little water has been absorbed by the large intestine. In constipation, too much water has been absorbed. Yeah, that is true, right? So too little water, so therefore, the water is sent out in the stools. That's why you get watery stools. And constipation, too much. So therefore, it's hard, right? I don't know, for some of us who might have children or who might be taking care of children, when a child is constipated, what do you do? I remember seeing my mother doing this with my younger brother. How, how, do you, how could you get them? You know, you say, see any child there, and you know, sometimes they're going, eh, eh, they're sweating. My mom used to rub the, the butt. So yeah, I remember butt. what my mother did. It's like cut a sliver of soap. What am I Blue soap. And you swizzle the water. Yeah, you take a swizzle. Well, I don't, I don't remember what type of soap it was. It could be blue or palm olive or, but you tickle <laughs> with the rectum, you know, you tickle it. And she said, tickle it, and it, it would come out, you know? So in other words, you're stimulating the muscles and to contract in terms of tickle. So you just take a piece of soup then, and then tickle. So it is also exercise mm -hmm. the legs and like yes. crossing the legs. Correct, because in doing that, it causes um, the contraction of the large intestine, very true, right? And it causes that um, action to occur and move it out. But yeah, I remember my mother particularly, you know, she cut a little a piece of soup, a sliver, you know, and then tickle, tickle the rectum. Sorry, I'm right. Sorry, so, go oh, ahead. Prune juice. What, pardon? Prune juice? Yeah. Yeah, there are some things, correct, that would stimulate, you know, the contraction of the large intestine to move it out. So prune juice is another one of them. Yes. And what, I, I don't know, for those of us, I don't, I'm not sure they do it anymore, but back in the day when I was in school and everything used to be in black and white, things wasn't in color. Um, before, like about, let's say it's two weeks to go after the August holidays, what, what your parents used to give you? A purge. A purge. A, purge. a worm out. Is it, with me, it was senny. I don't know if you all ever heard yes, about it. Senny. The senny yes. pod and the senny leaf. You go by the pharmacy and you buy it and they boil it. And also salts. So salts, correct, correct. Right? Now, now, you know, we, we would look at that and say, ah! but now, however, putting it, in the, putting it in perspective of this microbiome, it makes a lot of sense because, you know, and like, as I said, this is a, right now, this whole, when I uh, say, when you have, I'll see if I can pick up some papers, this right now. So I find the microbiome very interesting. It is. This is right now is like the, there's a lot of research in this area in terms of microbiome, um, tons of research because they they feel that this is exceptionally significant in terms of for well-being. So they're looking at the microbiome. So now it is, quote unquote, what the old people used to do. It suddenly makes a lot of sense. When you're doing a purge, what you're doing, you're moving out certain things from your body waste. And this could actually be helping the microbiome actually well, the microbiome really refers to the genetic component, and it also collectively refers to all the bacteria present in your gut. So not only the genetic component of those bacteria, but also the bacteria themselves. So you're helping out all of those bacteria by taking a page. So you know, removal of that waste. But as I said there, this is an area that is currently under, that is expanding daily in terms of any biological world because biological slash medical, they're seeing the importance of it, the microbiome, right? And so, then, but I was, um, mm -hmm. some, I was informed as well by a doctor that when you do too much, uh, like the cleaning and the gut, it interferes oh, yeah. with the lining. Correct. Correct. And not only the lining, it interferes with the, with the bacteria itself. We were to think yeah. about it. Correct. Correct. As with everything, so the much, of, too much of one thing is good for nothing. As it's to. Correct. Yeah. So too much of one thing is good for nothing. So which is why, of course, when you're looking at the quote unquote old people and what they used to do, all of that was um, what is it, mastered by years. Well, first of all, you'd have the oral tradition. So the how much to use would have been passed along from mother. Well, 
you know, from generation to generation. Well, use two senior leaf. Let me say, believe you me, one day somebody used five and it didn't work. Okay, we don't use five, we use two, you know, and then it, it came down. So most critically, dosage is very important. Even with medicines, as we're aware, there are specific doses for medicines. And of course, you know, every time you buy pills or any medication, they write, they put on the label how much you have to take. And if you exceed that dosage, you will have problems. It's the same thing for anything related to, let's say, um, diet, things to uh, enhance the microbiome, be it semi or otherwise. Oh, yes. Right, you have yes, to follow a certain dosage. Go ahead. All this stuff that our grandparents used to do a long time, like soaking peas before dry peas, before mm -hmm, we cook mm -hmm, it and stuff, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, we would see that it's beneficial to the, the microbiome and to digestion, making it easier for the peas mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. be broken down and stuff. Yeah, but yeah, we yeah. stop all of those stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. And, and in fact, a lot of the things we do now, of course, is ready made, right? You're feeling hungry, what you do? You call KFC. Right when it's sandwich Wednesday again, too. <laughs> you just buy these things. And the other thing as well is genetically modified foods. The food of themselves have been genetically modified. And this causes a whole nother problem. I was listening to a BBC um, uh, documentary just yes, day before yesterday, two days ago. And they were talking about, and you know, I never thought about it like this. Now, you ever thought in terms of the water we use, do you know the water we use could be a, a serious problem? Is it clean? Do we really know what is in the water? No. And one of the things they were pointing out, which I never thought about, you know, with pills, let's say pills or any medicines, what do we often do? We'll flush it down the toilet. Yeah? Okay, so we flush it down the toilet. Where does it go? It goes to the treatment plant. Yeah, but let's say the treatment plant doesn't, does not uh, break it down. So what they were talking about in particular, they were talking about uh, components from um, fertility pills. And I forget the specific component, but what they're saying is with some of those things, they not broken down. They, they, they did mention a component, I don't remember. That is not broken down in the treatment plant. So therefore when that water is given off, it goes into the rivers. And they were doing some research and they found that in this particular area, it was an estrogen, estrogen um, based component of the um, fertility drug, fertility drug. And what they found was this estrogen component, it was actually affecting the male fishes such that with the males, they found with some of them that in their testes, they saw the development of eggs occurring, egg-like structures occurring in the testes of some of these fishes. So of course, what does that point to? Some of these drugs which are being placed into the water system as we know it is getting to into, let's say, now the fishes and now we say we buy them. And one of, with these drugs, they're fat soluble. So that means they're kept in the fats of the fish and depending on which level of fish we buy, if it's low on the, um, in terms of the food web or higher, as they go up the food web, you know, the, you have the accumulation of this drug because it, more fat is actually, well, at least the higher up you go, the consumers eat more fish and this particular drug is kept in the fat. So therefore it just keeps multiplying as it goes up. And if we do consume the high level fish on the food web, now we could actually be, be affected by these drugs which are being absorbed. So, you know, and it, it just made me stop to think, you know, I never think about that, thought about it. We often think, you know, we just take water for granted, but what is really in it in terms of, or where does it, in, where does the things that go into the water, you know, is it really clean? You know, clean in terms of drugs, in terms of components, chemicals and so on. And it is, it is quite alarming, you know, they were talking about this other person who was doing research on it and they found like, the number of chemicals which they found they were doing sampling in the river Thames on the order of like a hundred thousand different chemicals they found in the water you know and it's really frightening when you think about it you know where that is concerned I hope I'm not alarming you all too much but all that this is you know you always have to be careful you know um, don't take things for granted regarding anything and who knows maybe this spate of diseases we are seeing it could be attributable to our water su supply 
you know, it could be. And when I say our water supply, I talk about the global water supply and treatment plants in general, globally, because they were talking about issues across the world, not only uh, related to England, but across the world, you know, this is something that is, that is um that should be focused upon. Okay. So that's like um that's like the study that was done a few years ago by UE. Mm -hmm. They were testing um water from a certain area. Mm -hmm. And when they did the test, they found out that this area's water supply had like a high level of lead, mm -hmm. like the yeah. unacceptable level. And when they confronted Wasa about it, Wasa said that um the water was perfectly fine, that they didn't mm -hmm. find any lead or anything like that. And there was a big um controversy about it. Yeah. In Chicago, what there was um what is the name of it? Um there's a big issue in Chicago. Um oh, I forget the area in Chicago. Flint, Michigan. Thank you, Flint, Michigan. Thank you very much. That's what Flint, Michigan. Flint, Michigan, which is in Chicago. Right? And but bottom line, it has to do um with the water supply they were taking water i think from a river which they knew had high levels of pollutants and they were still taking it right they shouldn't have been doing it and um they were just still taking it and they were putting it out into the general into the general population and what they found is that with the with the water that was being supplied in addition, I think it was had to do with the lead pipes as well. But bottom line, the persons began to show issues relating to lead poisoning, right? And um, it is a continuing process. You could have a look at it when you do have the chance. What is happening? What was happening in Flint, Michigan? But it was criminal because the thing was, these people knew. They knew that the water was contaminated, and they knew that it had to do with the piping system, and they still did not correct it. All right. So all that being said, yeah. Water, yeah, be careful with, with your water supply where that is concerned because it could be a carrier of, um, or could be a, a forerunner to certain diseases. And I'm sure as, arrived, as your colleague just pointed out there with you, we and Wasa, of course you will have deniability because there would be liability issues. Should they say, well, you know, that's true, you know, we really put out some dirty water there. Yeah, they'll never say that. You know, rule number one, you never, you know, incriminate yourself. They would always deny it, even though the facts are there, right? So that is something to think about. Okay, let's do three more and we'll call it a day. Milk of magnesia acts as a laxative because it makes the colon slippery. True or false? It's false. false. Right. It falls. It doesn't, right? Who answered that one there? Nah. And Marsha. Last name? Clement Atkinson and Nanlal. Right, um, Clement Atherton, right, and Nanla, it's a JK, Swinaila, Swinalia. Mm hmm. Right, very good. Yeah, right. So it does not, because with milk of magnesia, it does not like it does make the colon slippery. What would make the colon slippery is something with oil in it. If you, if you do put in sufficient things. So what would they normally, back in the day as well, what would they give you? Something with oil in it, or, you know, when you have- um, Castor oil. Castor oil. Yes, yeah. yeah, some people, as I said, all of those things go on the way, you know, some people mightn't be familiar with them, right? But had castor oil. I need to give you this to, to help you when, you have, when you're constipated. It's made from the castor bean, right? So castor oil, now of course they use castor oil. Go ahead. Also, give it olive oil. Olive oil, yeah. In fact, coconut oil will do the job as well, right? Yeah. Coconut oil, yeah. Actually, it really does stimulate you, you know, to go off when you're constipated, right? Very good. All right, let's do two more. Which of the following organ is considered an accessory organ of digestion? Liver. Why is it considered an accessory organ? Because it doesn't have because any, uh, it doesn't so because necessary it produces the bile to help break down the um, correct. And mm. when we look when we look at these answers, we, right, it produces bile. All of these these are parts the stomach, the esophagus, ascending colon and the rectum. 
They're all parts of the digestive tract. Oops, I hope it picks it up. Yeah. Right? So if you have to look at the digestive tract very simply, in fact, this one is better and it will pick it up. Yeah. Right? So you have the esophagus. The stomach is directly attached. So from the esophagus, it goes to the stomach. It goes to the, what's the other one? Stomach. The esophagus, ascending colon and the rectum. Right? Right? So when you look at it. Sir, they yeah? have two people in the waiting room. Thank you. Huh. Okay. So um, we mentioned diarrhea, saline drip. Right. We mentioned this one already, blah, blah, blah. Right. So the digestive tract. So the esophagus is a, is a as I say, is part of it. It goes to the stomach. And then what this one was? The ascending colon, right, the colon and the rectum, right? So then it goes down, of course, to the small intestine, large intestine. And so in other words, these are directly connected. These are parts, mm. right? So it goes through the small and the large intestine. The large intestine has the descending, the ascending transverse, descending colon. So all of these are direct, and it goes then to the rectum and then the anus. So all of these are parts, the stomach, the esophagus ascending. This is where the food actually parts to. As somebody pointed out, the liver, right, it secretes bile, and then the bile is actually then, via what structure does it enter the digestive tract? Gallbladder. The gallbladder is used to store the bile, but then it, it yeah, from, yeah, from there, is it not the bile duct? Does it end, or does the bile duct go from the liver? to the gallbladder. Let's have a look. I want to say it's the other way around, the bile duct, right? Right, the common bile duct from the liver itself, you have the common bile duct. The gallbladder is right, they said the common bile duct leaves from the, from the gallbladder actually, and then the bile duct, it secretes into the, uh, is the small intestine. So via the bile duct, the common bile duct, it, this is how it, it's actually secreted into the small intestine itself. So all of these, the stomach esophagus ascending, the food actually passes through these areas, but it doesn't pass through the liver. The liver secretes bile, which is stored in the gallbladder, and then it's secreted by the common bile duct into the small intestine, all right? So that's why, the liver is considered an accessory organ and it's not direct because it's not, the food doesn't directly pass through it. We good? Yes, yes sir. sir. All right, let's look at 33. All right, let's, that last one, who answered there? Allen. Sacha. Last name. Just Everybody last name. Answers you. Last name. Clement Atherton. Atherton. Matthew. Rodney. Hold on. Matthew, H -J -K -L. Matthew, right? Such Atherton. Uh, well, yeah, I got Atherton. I got Matthew. Who else? Hi. I got a, a male voice. Me, Khalil Khan. Khan, H I G. Khalil, very good. Anissa. Amy. Amy. Rodney. Okay, that's all. Rodney. Bruce Anika, Ryan. Alan. Alan. Calicia. Lutric answered it in the chat. Lutric? Okay, good. Yeah. Ali Lutric. as well. Just now. Lutric. Where is it? Lutric. Oh, Griffith. Right. Good. Who else? Ali. After Celine Ali. Yes, good. Who else? Aki. Aki? Ashley. Or oh, Ashley. Last name? Mongru. Mongru. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All right, good. Which of the following organs has both an endocrine and an exocrine? A. Yeah. Okay, okay. Who answered that one? <laughs> one person answered it first. Who was it? 
Masha. Nah, no, no, no. It was not male voice. No, 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 no. Masha. Masha. Yes. <laughs> yeah, nice. Your, in <laughs> fact, I know you all knew it, eh? Uh, Khalil and, and company, but I just wanted, I just taken the first one. All right, so I know you all knew it and you all did answer correctly, but the first one, yeah, was Miss Marsha Atterton. Very good. Which of the following organs produce bile? Okay, I take liver. Okay, I liver. 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 And that one. Khalil came out first on that one. <laughs> but, so I'm going right? to try to come out first on some now. And who come out second on that one? Somebody who said it second? Alan. I said liver. Alan. Alan. I said liver. Amy. Amy. Marsha. Clement. I think everyone should get a point because everyone knew. Because most of the last questions, everybody answered. Yeah. yeah. All right. So which of the following it produces bile? And where is it, where is bile stored? In the garden. Right there. Well, I heard a collective voice, so I couldn't differentiate there. But have some people want to come in here. Yeah, so it is stored in the gallbladder. So do take note of that. It's produced in the liver, bile, but it's stored in the gallbladder. Hmm. All right, so two more and then we're done. Which component in bile helps to emulsify fat in the duodenum? The salt. So if, bile. Answer, okay, I hear in A. So I think uh, it's C, bile salt. The yeah, salt. bile salt. Bile right. bile salt. Who is that, Khalil? Right, is the bile salts, and when we say emulsify, give me another word for emulsify. To dissolve, to combine, break down and dissolve. Yeah, to break down. I like the word break down better. Who is that? Who said that? Marsha. Marsha. Khalil, you answered too many already. I didn't give you. I didn't give Khalil a a break. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but very, very good, Khalil. Yeah, I'll give you the point. I'm just teasing you, right? So it, it does break up. And think about it. What do we mean by break up? Because sometimes we, we, we don't really get a concept. Let me see if I can get a picture to illustrate it. All right. Let's see. So let me see. Um, you might be familiar with this. Um, let's say cooking oil on water in the sink. I don't know if they, they'll have, you know, when you, um, let's see, do, 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 floating, I'm not seeing it. I should have put that. All right, cooking oil. I'm not seeing it either. It's not a very good image. Mm. Oh, um, I'm not seeing it. Let me just put oil on water. Okay, yeah. So y y some of us might be familiar with this. Let's say, you know, you're cooking, right? And you have, let's say you're washing up, um, You're washing, let's be dramatic. So let's say you're, you're looking at it, this, there's oil and water. So you now finish two chicken, you wash the pot and there's what happens, right? And you sink, you know, you have a layer of oil. So what do you do? You get detergent. And when you turn through detergent on the oil, what happens to the, what happens to the oil layer, right? Separate. It breaks up, right? Let me see if it, It separates, as somebody rightly says. Not... So it breaks up. The water is gonna get cloudy. Yeah, it gets cloudy. But most importantly, let's say the oil was covering the whole top of the of the layer. Actually, what happens is this. Yeah, it breaks up into you'll see like these little circles. I don't know if you, you'll see it. Form. Yeah, smaller form. And this is what, this is actually what emulsification is. So you break up, let's say you have a whole blob, you break them up into these smaller parts, right? And that is what emulsify. So in essence, emulsifying just means you're breaking up a big blob into smaller blobs. And that's what detergent does. 
Now, let me ask this question. As it relates to the coronavirus, how does a detergent kill it? How does that, how does it, you know, you'll see that it's effective against the coronavirus. How does it start, how does it, in essence, kill a virus? Based on this knowledge, what property of a virus do you think? What property, what part of the virus would it attack? Which part is that? Yeah. Which part of gravy on it? Which, so which part of the virus is fatty? The membrane. What you saying? Who said that one? Who said membrane? Uh, who that? Last name? Fuentes. Fuentes. <laughs> and so the person who actually said, well, the nucleus, a virus doesn't have a nucleus per se in term, but I, I know what you were thinking because the nuclear membrane does have, does the nuclear membrane have any lipid associated with it? But I would give you an idea. If you were thinking in terms of a membrane, I would give you it. So the person who said nucleus, who said nuclear? Samson. Samson. You're probably thinking along those lines of a membrane. So I would give you the credit for it. All right. But viruses really don't, they don't have nuclei, but you were thinking along the membrane line. So one of the things you have to remember, very good, right? Membranes. So let's say the, the fluid mosaic model of a membrane, right? Let me look at the fluid mosaic model. What does it tell you? Well, the fluid mosaic model tells you, you have these cholesterol, you have fats, right? Cholesterol, which are actually parts of the membrane itself. So the detergent, when you add detergent or use soap, what it does, it attacks or it causes these cholesterol. Now you have lipid rafts. So what do we mean by lipid rafts? You have a lot of cholesterol, which actually aggregate within the membrane. So you have large areas where you would have, let's say, just lipids. So what the detergent does, it breaks it up. And in so doing, it breaks up the integrity of the membrane. So in S dot, 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 it breaks up the membrane by attacking specifically the areas of cholesterol. So as I mentioned, you do have areas on the membrane known as rafts, where you have a lot of them aggregating. So that is why, you know, you would see that, yes, wash your hands with soap, very good for destroying the membrane because when we look at um, the viral membrane, of a virus, right? Even though this one is not shown, let's get some. Is HIV? I believe you may remember this one very well. It's area of research, HIV, right? But when you look at a uh, uh, mm. right, the viral membrane itself, it does have another thing, a nice one. But you do have within the membrane itself, you do have these areas where you have um, fats. So therefore, when you use soap, in fact, anything would work, any detergent, detergents, soap. So you could literally, literally you washing your hands with dishwashing liquid would work, washing it with breeze, with tide, uh, would actually work. You disrupt the membrane because it is targeting those cholesterol, breaks it up. So therefore the membrane collapses and now the viral component is exposed to the external environment and it's very harsh and it breaks it down. All right, so that's how actually soaps work in terms of, not only with viruses, that's why you wash with soap. Because of the fact microorganisms, they have in their cell membrane components, they do have these lipid areas. So the detergent, the soap targets it, breaks it down, and by extension, it mashes up the membrane, exposing the internal environment to the harsh external environment, and that's how you destroy the microorganism. So always remember, wash your hands with soap. Yeah? Good. And that is what emulsification of fats mean. Emulsification just means breaking up the fat. And since you have these, these bits of fat present in the membrane, you break up those fats, and in so doing, you destroy the membrane of the beta virus or another microorganism. All right. Actually, sir. Go ahead. Um, quick question. 
Yeah. You know, some soap doesn't be as soapy as other soap. Have nothing to do with it. Of, nope. Okay, it must nope. still be as effective as the Correct is soap. right. So the main okay. thing to look at is the detergent content, right? So the soap, this is the, so in other words, is the detergent content related to the soapiness? To be honest, I don't know. Because there are other things, of course, that they put in the soap, they put um, different enhancers and so on. But I can't answer that question, to be honest. Let me be very honest. If there's a correlation between soapiness and the detergent content, I do not know. No, sir, there isn't. There isn't? Okay. But I can't soap speak with any... um, mm -hmm. Soap is the salt of sodium hydroxide, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, some detergents would have a high salt content, but... Mm -hmm less of the sudsiness. Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. makes soap bubbly. Correct. Yeah, the sudsiness. Yeah. yeah. I just I just I just don't know. So taking the word of your colleague, then you know there isn't that correlation. But I would tend to agree because it's just the efficacy. It's really the sodium hydroxide content, which is which is really responsible for breaking up those lipid um, the lipid bilayer which is present in the in the mm -hmm. let's say a virus. I made soap mm -hmm. once in, in chemistry class. So really? Oh, oh, so you yeah. looked at it in detail. Very good. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So there you go. So to answer your question then. Thank you. Right? Great. Thanks very much. Okay. Last question. Um, 37. Which of the following organs? And let me, let me hear from somebody who didn't answer for the day. All right? Who didn't answer yet. And Gozi, you there? I think I saw Ngozi. Yes, and Gozi. We're gonna throw this one for you. Which of the following functions to remove poisonous substances? C. And the answer C. is C. All right. Yeah. So, so you are saying which of the following organ? Oh, we're talking organs. So, in terms of the organs, let me break it, make it simpler for you. The stomach or the liver? Which one removes poisonous substances? And which one do you think? E. E. Very. That's and goes. You answer. Yes, sir. Huh? Yes, sir. Okay, very good, and goes. So you got a point for it. And the answer is indeed E. Yeah, the liver. So that's one of the things that the liver does. So is why it's very important. It removes poisonous substances and works to keep the contents of the blood constant. Very important. And what does that have, have a lot to do with in terms of your liver? Well, for those of us who like to take in, the, what is the waste product of fermentation that people like to drink? Well, I kind of give it away. Alcohol. 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 Alcohol, right? So the one part of your body that actually works is a poison. You're well aware of this, right? So when we look at the process of fermentation, let's just quickly pop that and then we look to call roll and call it a day. The process of fermentation, what is fermentation? Well, you have these microorganism, all they do, they need a sugar source and they break down the sugar, right? To generate energy. And in so doing, they release ethanol. Ethanol. Right, or an alcohol. And what do we do? We take that alcohol, we extract it, right? Be it at the Carib Brewery or at Fernandez. And we take off that alcohol. We put it in a bottle with a pretty label, right? And what do we do? We sell it and we drink it. So in essence, what we are doing, we are actually taking the waste product, right? When these microorganisms break down sugars, right? When they which is present nearly in anything. This is why they need a source of sugar. So for those of us, anybody here is make wine? You can make wine from anything. You need carbohydrates. That's carbohydrates, true. of course, are complex sugars, right? So you need it, you get it. That's why you could make it from potato, anything with a carbohydrate in it. Potato wine, right? You could you use yeast and you, you set it up there and it begins to break it down and it creates alcohol as part of the process. And we extract the alcohol and you get wine or you just, you flavor it. You, well, you use things which have flavors in them and you, know, it, you drink it off, but it has the alcohol in it. So let me ask this question. When we're making bread, fermentation occurs, not so when you have yeast. So why doesn't, why doesn't bread taste like alcohol? Because when you bake it, the alcohol evaporates. <laughs> well done, well done, yeah. When you bake it, the alcohol actually comes off. 
right? It evaporates. So that's why you don't have <laughs> alcoholic bread. When you bake bread and you eat it, you don't get drunk because it is, it is vaporized as it. So bottom line, back to what we're talking in terms of alcohol, right? We take that alcohol and we take it in. And this is where the liver is important because the liver actually breaks it down. Alcohol is a toxin. It's a really waste product from these bacteria, microorganisms, be it yeast or different microorganisms in the atmosphere that break it down. So what do we, we, so that's why the liver is very important. And interestingly enough, the hepatocytes, which are the cells of the liver, all of them do the same thing. So what, why is that important, you think? Why is it important, you think, that all the cells in the liver do the same thing? Right? So in other words, they're redundant. Why, why is that important in terms of function? All of them do the same thing. So what does that mean in terms of a positive? Something that is positive for you. All of them do the same thing. So that means what? Toxins will be removed quickly. One, toxins, yes. And what's another thing as well? If everything is doing the same thing, what is that as it relates to injury? It'll uh, heal faster. Then... Yeah, it will heal faster, yes, because the hepatocytes could be replaced. What else? And if part is damaged, you will still have the other part. There you function. go, yes, yes, right? So there's something called cirrhosis of the liver. Right, cirrhosis. Right, cirrhosis of the liver. That is when literally, yeah, the cells begin to die off. Now, I did mention that the liver is one of the unique organs. They could, it, it regenerates itself. However, if it is, let's say, in certain instances, you're constantly taking in alcohol. What would happen is, yeah, the cells eventually will start, lose that ability to regenerate and they begin to die. Interestingly enough, with the liver, you could you could lose about 60% functionality of the liver and your liver will still work. So when you hear somebody has liver failure, you know, brought about by cirrhosis, usually caused by alcohol um, ingestion, that means it's more than half the liver gone, right? And one, one story um, I always remember with that, right? Um, there's this guy, um, George Best. Um, right, he was a footballer back in the 60s, early 60s and 70s. This was him. Here he is with Pele, right? Edson Arantes de Nascimento, also known as Pele. And um, George Best, this is him here on the left. So he was an exceptional footballer, but the problem, well, as with many things, usually when there are people who are exceptional, they usually have a flaw, right? Oftentimes, if you read in Greek tragedies and mythology, you know, these, these persons oh, who were highly praised, but they usually had a flaw. And with him, his flaw was, well, you know, wine, woman, and song. He used to live hard, but he was an exceptional footballer, right? But he used to live hard and particularly drink. So the thing was with him, long story short, even after retired, still living hard, particularly drinking, his liver failed. And, you know, uh, he got a liver transplant and they told him, you know, well, you have a liver transplant, you wouldn't be able to, you know, live like how you lived again. Uh, so he stopped drinking for like two years. Then he started back drinking. And I remember one time they asked him, you know, this was when he was, when he was um, still sober, well, not sober, sorry, when he had stopped drinking, you know, for two years, um, you know, they asked him, okay, you know, you stopped drinking for two years, you know, how does it feel? He was like, look, you know, two years I stopped drinking, but he said, there isn't a day that goes by when I don't think about drinking, right? So sometimes, you know, it's important to think about even persons who are alcoholic, it's a disease, it really is you know, where they have to drink. But long story short, he got a liver transplant and he went back and started to drink again. And his donated liver failed and he died at the age of 60, right? George Best. And it was tragic, right? Because of the fact that, you know, it was, well, in a way it could have been uh, preventable. This was him when he was younger, shown here. But he was, like, as I said, he had dazzling skills and champagne lifestyle. He, this is him here as well. You know, he was an exceptional footballer. 
talent to burn, right? But, you know, as I said, with certain people as well, when they're exceptional, they do have a flaw somewhere else. And his flaw or his shortcoming was he was an alcoholic and he couldn't stop. He couldn't stop drinking, yeah? So, you know, for persons, I know you might know persons who drink a lot and so on. Sometimes you have to be empathetic with them. Yes, they behave special and so on, but it's a flaw and it's a disease. It really is a disease, you know, in terms of alcoholism. All right? So you always do remember that, that fact. All right? Okay. Okay, I don't want to start. I, like some people are not hearing anything. Let me, let me st let, let, let's get a, a more cherry question to end on. We don't want to end on that. So, but when some people have um, kidney kidney problems, their liver yeah. do... Um, yeah. Because function as well. Correct, correct. You do have it as well. Um, because of the fact the kidney, one of the kidney regulates um water water and salt content, particularly in your body, and it could have an effect in terms of let's say if it's putting out what's the correlation between the kidney and the liver. Okay, I join up blanks on it now. Um so I can't answer that question, but there is a correlation. Yes, when you do have, uh, when your kidney fails, it increases the toxin. It does increase toxins in the blood um, when you do have kidney failure, and it could lead to liver. Yes, liver issues. But I just can't see the correlation right now. I just draw in a blank. But that that is true. That is true. All right. Okay. Last one. Last question. All right, 53. And that is it. Which of the following substances is not a product formed in the small intestine? Okay, not 53. Sorry. 56. Sorry, 56. I oh, really wanted to say. Which of the following comparisons is not correct? C. C? Why is it C? Why is it C? No, C is correct. Right? So fats are broken down by lipase. Starch is broken down by salivary amylase. What is broken down by lactase? That's a, that's a, a milk enzyme. What is broken down by lactase? Something that sounds very close yeah. to lactase. Lactose. Lactose, very good, right? It's a milk sugar. It's broken down by lactase. And some of us who are lactose intolerant, you don't have this being present, lactase. And again, when it's not broken down, it's passed through and it causes irritation. In the, in the stomach and it causes you to go off. And those persons who are lactose intolerant, they don't usually produce a lot of lactase. So lactose is not broken down. Particularly persons of African descent, right? Can I ask a question, please? You surely can. So um, at, if you're not lactose at a um, young age, can you get it at an older age? Lactose intolerance? Yes, sir. Yeah, you mean as you get older? Yeah, it usually, yes. you could get it. You know, there's a funny thing with the body, even though there are certain rules associated that we know associated with the body, which you would find in the literature, in the medical text, there are always exceptions, right? And, but one of the things is, yes, as you do get older, could you develop lactose intolerance? The answer is yes. You know, whereas when you're younger, ah, blah, 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 you're drinking milk, blah, blah, blah. Then suddenly as you get older, you find anytime you're drinking milk, you're going off or you need to go to the bathroom. Yes, that could happen, most definitely. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I'm lactose intolerant, right? So I was yes. doing some research on it, and I yes. read that most, most adults, well, a large percentage of adults, just end up being lactose intolerant as they, when they get older because they no longer need the enzyme as much as they did when they were younger. The thing is, yeah, the thing is this you know, we're really not supposed to be drinking milk, you know. If you think about it, when do we need milk? If you look in general at animals and so on. With, with, at which stage do you drink milk? You only, it's only when you're a baby, right? When you look at cows, it's only calves. Even with us, you know, you only suckle when you're young, right? And that's it. So therefore, in terms of the body producing lactase in particular, you only really produce it when you're young. And I said afterwards, you know, you're, you're not really supposed to see it, quote unquote, right? You're not supposed to see this milk again after, after you know, you pass eight, seven, more eight, I see no milk. But with us, 
you know, in terms of our diet, well, we use milk, you know, from different so from cows, goats, from other sources. But in truth, in fact, we're not really supposed to be using it. So our bodies then have not, is not adapted to use milk beyond a certain age. And you're quite right. So therefore, you know, as you get older, in other words, the body's saying, dude, I, I see in this milk, I really don't know what to do with it. Because, you know, I only programmed to use milk until, let me say, age 10. And here it is now, I'm 50 and you gave me, what, what is this? You gave me milk. <laughs> I can't recognize this, right? I, I've lost the ability to remember how to break this down by using lactase. And that is exactly what happens. So you're quite right. Yeah, because of the fact the enzyme isn't produced. So hard written into those 23 pairs of chromosomes in our cells. Somewhere along there, there's a note that says, hey, you know, you only produce lactase when you're young. So by around age 15, we stop producing lactase. It don't make sense. But we have ourselves, because of our diet, we still use it. And that is where the problem in terms of lactose intolerance. So even with me, I agree. I have the same problem. When I eat ice cream, it's like rolling dice. Certain ice creams. Strangely enough, you know, those from the factory, like 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 processed ice cream. Those from, let's say, I was going to say cannings, but they're not cannings anymore. Flavor right. Flavor right. Creamy. 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 Oh, yeah. Those I can the, eat that one without any yes, problem. But you see the ones from, you know, the natural ones, quote unquote, you know, um, dreamy, creamy, those that um, that actually have a lot of milk content in it, like dreamy, creamy, or bees ice cream, those that are produced locally, can't. It's rolling dice. But the ones that are processed, like flavor right, I don't think flavor right are wrong anymore, though. They close down and they have another name now. They have a pretty container. It's the same factory, I'm sure, but they just changed the name. But like from flavor right and so on, I don't know if probably the source of the milk is different. I think it has to do with the um the fact that creamy uses like milk solids rather than right. milk solids as opposed whereas Some those milk. other ones they use real milk, yeah. Milk, yeah. Yeah, correct. Because there's a big, like I tell you, those that come processed, you know, or even the foreign ones imported ice creams, I could eat those, no problem. But the, the true, true ones, quote unquote, like the dreamy, creamy and all of them can't eat it. It's like rolling dice. Sometimes it will work, sometimes, as soon as I eat it five minutes later, I have to use the, the, the little boy's room as it will. All right? Good. All right. So we'll stop there for today. So uh, the, um, the dairy milk and the plant-based milk have different reactions. Hmm. Plant based. Oh, you're talking about, <laughs> of course, the, the um, what do they say? The, the jury is out on that one. Should you say, I was not going to say that. Should almond, should that really be called? There are some purists who say that, you know, milk only comes from a teat, you know, from a, a nipple. You know, and that's the only true source of a, of a, of a, um, of milk. So that these other things are not truly milk. You know, like almonds and rice, and all of those things is not. Truly. So it all it depends on your definition of milk. So some people will say that they're not really milk. That's really um, you know, something else, as it will. But but to answer your question, then it's totally different. Yes. They do contain different uh, substances in it. So which is why, if I'm not mistaken, like persons who are lactose intolerant, you could you could drink quote unquote almond milk and rice milk and things like that. Because yeah. they're they're, um, they're totally different, you know, in terms of their um, components than the milk that comes, I say, from a teat or another, you know, in that regard. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have lactose. Correct. Right, so it's different. And as I said, the purists will tell you that um, they don't consider that as milk <laughs> because it doesn't come from a other, it doesn't come from a teat, you know, T-W-T, right? But they do call it almond. And they have so many of them out now, almond rice. Which are the ones oats. that have? Oats, I didn't oats. use oats. Right, um, non-traditional. They use coconut too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Cashew. Cashew, yeah, Cashew, I saw that yeah. one recently. Oats and the almond. Let's see what they have. It have a whole lot out now, right? Almond, soy, rice, um, uh, cashew, coconut, coconut. Cashew. Yeah, right. There's a whole lot out right now, right? Where that is concerned. All right. So let me stop the recording for today. Where is recording. Stop recording.